wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Now, the owner speaks to only one of this group of workers who apparently is the spokesman for the group. <clears throat> His response is corrective and disapproving, yet delivered in a friendly manner. Very friendly. He addresses him gently as my friend. It could also be translated as comrade. The kindness and benevolence of the master extends even to these grumbling workers. I don't think the workers represent the uh, unregenerate or represent the Pharisees, as some suppose. They're treated gently and they're given their reward. The owner's response contains two basic arguments followed by a question designed to cause them to examine their motives. First, he notes that no injustice has taken place at all because he kept to the terms that both sides accepted in the original verbal contract. They made an agreement. They came to an agreement. It's a verbal contract. And they were paid exactly what they were promised. He did what he said he was going to do. And therefore, any grumbling about unfairness is unfair. If we agree to do something in advance, we have no right biblically or morally or logically or practically to complain about it later. If you agree to something, do it. And don't grumble. The only possible thing that could affect an agreement would be the use of coercion. And there was obviously no coercion here. Or if somebody agreed to do something that was unscriptural. If you agree to something, like let's say you agree to marry a pagan and you're not married yet, you break the contract because it's totally unscriptural. It'd be a sin to do it. Well, that obviously doesn't apply here either. Now, he forms this argument <clears throat> by asking a question that emphasizes the voluntary nature of the agreement and the personal act of the workers in accepting it. This one question forces the workers to face reality. It is a question that they cannot answer without admitting that they are wrong. <clears throat> Now, after the first argument is made, the landowner commands the first workers to take, it's an aorist imperative, or literally take up their money and go. Now, the money was apparently laid down on a table or a bench <clears throat> or a counter. This, uh, this command has been interpreted as representing an excommunication or a threat of excommunication, but such Jews read too much into the parable. The fact that they receive a relatively gentle rebuke, designed to correct, and receive their pay as well as the others refutes such speculative interpretations. I don't think it refers to excommunication at all, or even a threat of excommunication. It's a gentle rebuke, it's an admonition. The reality <clears throat> um, that they receive their pay lasts and are admonished is enough to teach the disciples what they need to know. The point is, is Christ is getting this bad attitude out of the disciples' head, and he's using this to do it. Christians who in this life are envious or jealous of other believers punish themselves by not experiencing the joy that they ought to have for the good things that God does give them. That's what's so bad about envy. Envy, envy becomes a kind of a self-punishment because you're not content. You're not happy about what you do have. Those who have a problem with envy or discontentment murmur and torment themselves instead of enjoying their blessings as they ought. The teaching before us is exceedingly useful in not only correcting our attitude toward others, but also in having a full appreciation of the gracious gifts that we do have. Let us be happy with what God has given us. Let us be content with what God has given us. And let us reject all forms of envy. And the second argument... He appeals to his sovereign right as the estate owner to pay his workers as he pleases. It was his desire, his will, to pay those hired last the same amount as those hired first. 
This emphasizes that God's grace is dispensed according to his good pleasure, and it is wrong for us to try to analyze or judge it in terms of human concepts of merit or typical rules of economics. Now, I, I believe in free market economics, certainly, and, and you can even get principles of free market economics out of this parable. You know, the parable assumes that the man has a right to pay as he pleases. The state doesn't have a right to come in and tell him what to do. Okay, this, this parable presupposes free market economics under biblical law. Of course, that's not the thrust of the parable. <clears throat> but we don't want to analyze how God does things in terms of human concepts of fairness or even human concepts of economics. Because we are given not what we deserve. If we were given what we de deserve, we'd all go to hell. And what are the rewards of grace? No believer really deserves to receive what they are given by God. And this point is made plain by Luke 17.10, which is a very important passage used during the Protestant Reformation against Roman Catholicism. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Now remember, the servants that were hired last were regarded as not worth hiring by everyone else. They were the scum of society. The master chooses them and gifts them abundantly, even though they in themselves were not worthy. Jesus is emphasizing a fundamental aspect of the gospel in which God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Romans 9.15 and Exodus 33.19. That's the emphasis here. And when you take that into consideration, all thoughts of envy, all thoughts of one-upmanship, all thoughts of self-glorification are obliterated. God has created all things. He's the sovereign ruler and owner of everything in creation. Man is not only finite, but man is a sinful creature and thus is unable to merit anything before God or make demands upon him based on good works. Therefore, <clears throat> we must never attempt to second guess or argue with God in his disposals of providence. You know, why do I have to go through this? That guy over there, he seems like a kind of a lazy bum to me and he, look, at, look at how he's being blessed. We're not to engage in that kind of thinking. We have to just trust God and just leave it to him. Trust in God. We are not to complain when we do not get what we would like, nor quarrel when others are blessed for great, uh, far greater than ourselves. We are to be content with God's dealings with us and others because God sovereignly dispenses grace as he pleases. And you read the New Testament, you read the Gospels, God likes to pick losers and make them into great men. Who would, would anyone pick Peter, a fisherman, who had a bad temper, who didn't have very well good control of himself? Would somebody pick him and make him the chief spokesman for the apostles? Only Christ could do something like that. Only God would do that. We would not do that. Would God, uh, would we pick a, a, mat, a murderer, a killer, who deserves the death penalty? Would we make him the greatest of all the apostles? Paul, a persecutor of Christians? No. God's grace does not function on our principles of economics or human concepts of fairness. It's grace. <laughs> the secret counsel of God's will is beyond our purview. And thus we must trust in his goodness, mercy, and wisdom in such matter. We must never complain against his acts of grace because we think of them as too little or too much. Because nothing received is really deserved anyway. The first workers and the last workers didn't really receive any, deserve anything. Things that may appear arbitrary and unjust to us will in the end reveal God's infinite wisdom. Whatever he does will glorify himself and further the ends of his kingdom of grace. We need to be happy with that. We need to be content with that. Once the apostles see that they're being chosen to salvation was all of grace, their calling as apostles and our other good works were completely the result of sovereign grace, and his blessings in this life and the rewards to come all flow from God's sovereign mercy, God's sovereign good pleasure, then they will no longer have a mercenary spirit. 
All concepts of debt, self-glorification, and boasting are obliterated by this parable. The emphasis on the parable is not so much the amount received, but rather on the compassionate, merciful dispenser of the reward. Yeah, the focus is on God. His sovereignty, grace, and goodness is the main focus of the parable. And then third, <clears throat> the master follows up, follows up the previous argument with a question designed to expose the absurdity of their envy. Uh, 15b. Or is your eye evil because I am good? Now the evil eye here is a metaphor, an ancient metaphor for an envious, stingy, or jealous attitude. It likely came about because the eyes roll in causing envy. The eye is often both the inlet and the outlet of the sin of envy. Saul saw how God had prospered and blessed David. Remember that? And he would stare at him. He would eye him. And his envy would burn within him. And he'd become full of anger and outrage and want to kill David. For Samuel 18, 9, and 15. It is an evil eye which is displeased at the good of others and desires their hurt. Remember, envy. Don't lift. It's not, oh, let me go out and work hard and lift myself up. It's no, let me drag down others in our culture. Let's drag down the rich. Let's blame the oil companies. Let's blame the corporations. Let's blame the rich and drag them down. Let's steal their money. Let's punish them. Envy. Envy is a grief to ourselves. It's an anger to God and it's ill will toward our neighbors. It is a sin that neither pleases nor profits nor honors. It is wicked. The first laborer's envy, laborer's envy was based on the master's goodness. Now the word good in this uh, verse here is a common Greek adjective for good, agathos, for ethical goodness. <clears throat> in this context, it refers to the owner's generosity or beneficence. The opposition of the adjectives evil and good here reveals the ra radical irrationality of those who complain because they are angry with God's extension of grace and mercy to undeserving sinners. They're angry at God for being good. How, think of how evil and absurd that is. It reminds us of the elder brother's attitude in the parable of the prodigal son. Very similar. There the supposedly worthy elder brother expresses our outrage at the father's generosity at the unworthy younger brother. The unworthy son who, who in his mind deserved nothing. You see, the older brother in this case would rather let the, the younger son starve to death than see him blessed, than see mercy extended to him. He was angry with his father because of his compassion, love, and generosity. He would rather see his younger brother die in the mud and be consumed by pigs than to be raised up by his father. That's evil. Now, in the parable of the prodigal son, the Pharisees and the unbelieving Jews receive a fitting critique. That's what it's directed toward. In this parable, their disciples receive instruction to correct their ungodly tendencies in this area. The Lord had detected an envious spirit in Peter's question. The apostles were apparently desiring eminence and preeminence for their being the first who were attached to Jesus and for their great sacrifice in remaining with the Savior through his ministry. Believe me, it was tough. They didn't drive around in air-conditioned cars. They had to leave their families. They had, to, they had to go through a lot of pain and suffering. Our Lord lets them know that indeed their reward will be great. They're going to. Re I, I think the apostles will be probably the most exalted people in heaven, and people like Calvin and Abraham. But he adds this parable so they would understand that many who come after them would be just as eminent and blessed in reward. And even more importantly, everything every believer will receive is a result of God's sovereign work of grace, mercy, and benevolence. It is not because anyone is intrinsically great. Okay, you apostles, get this idea out of your head that you're great men. Now think about it. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, they'd be fishermen. They'd be unknown to history. 
There had been no miracles. There had been no Pentecost. There had been no, none of the great things that happened. 5,000 believing in one day. 4,000 believing this day and being baptized. None of that would have happened without God's sovereign grace. The disciples had been given a privileged position, yet they must maintain biblical humility in everything. And then this brings us to the main point of the parable. Our Lord concludes this parable by repeating, in a slightly different form, the saying of 1930. <clears throat> so the last will be first and the first last, 16. Now if we interpret this epigram in light of 1930, which was directed at the disciples' attitude of superiority and self-exaltation. Then there's verse underlines 1930 and the parable that follows it. It is a warning. Do not be among the first who will become last. It's an implicit warning. Now here the expressions first and last are not focused on time, but really on rank in the kingdom. Do not be like those who had a privileged position, but who, because of their mercenary spirit, envy, pride, and a failure to recognize God's sovereignty and its dispensing of grace, gifts, and rewards, becomes least in the kingdom. Get that attitude and change it to an attitude of appreciation for God's grace and sovereignty. Do not have an envious spirit or a superiority complex because such things are highly destructive of sanctification and will be a spiritual drag on your life. That's what he's teaching. Those who have such an attitude will not receive the rewards or position they seek. And this is a very common teaching in Scripture. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. That's what he's teaching. All thoughts of preeminence in God's kingdom must be displaced with thoughts of God's sovereign grace. Everything about us and everything good we do comes from God. Consequently, pride, boasting must be replaced with humility. Once again, it is important that we consider the fact that Jesus is not retracting or contradicting the promises of 1928-29. For Jesus does tell the disciples, he says, you're going to be highly exalted in the coming kingdom. You're going to be highly rewarded in the coming eschatological kingdom. He's not contradicting that. He's not denying it. But after detecting a sinful, arrogant attitude, our Lord carefully admonishes the disciples so such thinking will be dipped in the bud. His teaching was effective in that we do not encounter this spirit on the part of the apostles in the history, the inspired history recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. You don't see this in the book of Acts. You don't see uh, uh, this, this attitude of trying to be superior or trying to lord it over the other apostles. It's completely absent from the book of Acts. Their humility and their cooperation were superb. Unfortunately, such humility and cooperation is often lacking in churches today. Many modern churches and churchmen in our day imitate our culture. And thus they seek to make stars out of popular pastors. They're like rock stars or something. They're like movie stars. And they seek to build little empires. They really do like a star system. Professing Christians, pastors and elders are often guilty also of gossiping and tearing others down in an effort to exalt themselves. This happened to me a number of years ago where people tried to tear this church down and tear this ministry down solely for their own gratification and exalting of themselves. Such an unbiblical attitude and the un ungodly behavior that flows from it will cause many who seem to be first in this age to be last in the coming eschatological kingdom. And then the concluding saying, 16b, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now this uh, is not in some of the early manuscripts, 
which are favored by Westcott and Morton, are favored by people who reject the majority text, people who reject the, reject the text for receptus and think it's defective. Well, they're wrong. It, it does belong in the passage, and it does help the passage. At first glance, this uh, reason seems somewhat unrelated to the preceding parable, but it strongly supports the main argument. It is designed to underline the sovereignty of grace that should lead to humility, a lack of envy, and a rejection of a mercenary spirit. There are many who are called with the outward call of the gospel. They hear the good news. They may even understand it intellectually. Some may even attend church for a while. But only those who have been chosen by God before the foundation of the world will be regenerated, effectually called by the Holy Spirit, and justified by the sacrificial death of Christ. And of course, his perfect life. This is the doctrine of unconditional election. You'd be surprised most commentators, all modern commentators, don't even consider this phrase. They, first of all, they, they believe in Westcott and Hort. They bought into the uh, mythology developed by two modernists. Uh, but a lot of people don't think, well, how does this relate to what proceeds? Well, it relates beautifully. <clears throat> Believers have no reason to boast in glory in their works because God predestinated them to salvation in Christ. As Paul says, Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now listen to when this was all planned out and why it takes place. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Then in the context of chapter 1, beforehand, before the foundation of the world. This was all according to God's plan before we were created, before the world even existed. The master who went to the town square chose some workers who were not desired by others and were unworthy. And they ended up being first because of the master's sovereign choice, not because they were intrinsically great. And Paul even notes in Corinthians, not many wise, not many mighty. Uh, you, look at, you look at Christendom, you don't see many people who are uh, noted as, as, as brilliant scientists and all that. It's rare. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise in his wisdom, to glorify the gospel, to glorify his son. Jesus is telling his disciples that it is solely because of God's sovereign choice that some are exalted and others are passed over. Because all men are sinners and deserve nothing, this choice flows from God's love and goodness. This strongly reinforces the preceding parable. With this theological mindset, no one should complain about their position in the kingdom, and no one should boast about their achievements or status. If it wasn't for the electing love of God, we'd all be in the marketplace with no one to hire us because we're unworthy, we're undesirable. If God wills to reveal his own goodness in the choosing of his elect and in giving them the reward of grace, those that grumble about this only show that they are evil and cannot understand the infinite depths of the goodness of God. Election is the sovereign cause of salvation. And the reward of grace which the people of God receive is a reward that is rooted in the eternal decree of election. So we give God the glory. <clears throat> this is a humbling doctrine. It casts all concept of intrinsic human greatness into the dust. And it is an unpopular doctrine in our day because it destroys human, humanistic, Concepts of salvation. Semi-Pelagianism, Arminianism, Roman Catholicism, and so on. People hate this doctrine. It's hated by most professional Christians. However, it exalts God's sovereign grace. We are not saved because of our free will. We are not saved because of our choice. We are not saved because we are wiser or gooder or better than anyone else. We are saved solely because of God's sovereign choice. This teaching is hated precisely because it destroys human pride and all self-glorification. It teaches us to cast all the rewards of grace at the pierced feet of the Savior, to give Him the glory and take none for ourselves.
doesn't it? It really teaches us that. For we are all unworthy workers that he has graciously chosen. What a wonderful doctrine. So let us not envy. Let's not have a mercenary spirit. Let's not have a merit-mindedness about what we do. Let us appreciate it when people, when God exalts other believers, even if they may rub us the wrong way. Let us appreciate it. Let us think good of it. Let us have no envy. Let us focus on the love of God, the mercy of God, the sovereignty of grace, the electing love of God, and envy will be destroyed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful teaching. Your son's parables are some of the, really the greatest ever written. We thank you that he's revealed this unto us to keep us in check. For our sinful tendency is to complain. Our sinful tendency is to have envy. Our sinful tendency is to be merit-mindedness. Part of sin for nature, Lord. Correct it with his teaching. Cause us to walk according to thy statutes. Cause us to appreciate thy holy law, to hide it in our heart, and to appreciate your sovereign grace and to give you all the glory for everything that we receive. In Jesus' name, amen.